So until next time. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> the awkward silence. <laughs>everybody welcome back to the side by side guys off-road podcast i am big z i am ian with full throttle battery and this is episode 13 of the off-road podcast coming from you coming <laughs> wow i just you'll really butchered that one up oh you'll get there you you can tell it's uh the stay in place order is uh starting to wear on us are getting a little loopy with our words yeah how you guys doing over there and uh out in the farmlands Staying busy, staying busy. Work-wise, it's been, I would say it's probably been busier uh, the last five working days than it's been in the last probably prior 10. So we'll take it for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done for those that have the ability to get it done. There's a lot to pick up, so. Yeah, I haven't been, uh, prior to uh, last Friday, I hadn't been on the road to actually do dedicated uh, work-related type stuff in quite a while, but that's changed in the last few days, so it's good. It's good. I had to remember how to drive again, but uh, <laughs> and, and it's just it's just like my side-by-side, just throw it and drive and hit the gas and Skinny pedal. hope for the best. Right. For sure. So... Um yeah, excited to be back here with you, uh, discussing industry in- information and news, and uh, talking recent events. Uh, something that's uh, we covered last episode was a Speed UTV launch. Well, I guess that's not technically a launch; it was just the uh, details starting to trickle out of Robbie Gordon uh, during his weekly uh, briefings. And he's uh, doing a good job of keeping people excited. He's, uh, I mean, they they obviously understand that you know if you're not pushing out content and information, you're gonna you're gonna die of old age in the news cycle. So, um, awesome to see them kicking in the butt to uh, get more information in, in front of people and and keep us excited to see something, you know, the whole uh, nomenclature of uh, of changing the game, something that we we get annoyed by, but they have the most potential to do so. So. Um, they came out this last week with some information about the transmission, which we were uh, hoping to get. Uh, and uh, one of the most interesting parts of that is that they're going to come out with a three-speed transmission. So uh, you're going to get your normal park, reverse, neutral, low and high, but they're also going to include a third option for cruise, which um, Gordon kind of explained as a going wide open for long amounts of time where you're not doing a lot of up and down cycling on the clutch. Um so he hasn't really given us much more information other than that, but uh, the idea being that you have a third gear to do high RPM for extended amounts of time. So what are your thoughts on that? I think it's interesting. I think that um, it'd be more interesting if there was, um, instead of a cruise mode, that there was a kind of in-between, like a mid-gear that was more uh, focused on fast starts and stopping where you're, you're jumping large ranges really quick versus having just a general low and high gear right Uh, Right. i mean i mean technically high is cruise for most people so i would like to see i would have liked to have seen something that was more geared towards uh, abrupt stopping and starting where the gearing's a little bit more of a ramp up uh, in a steep sense versus you know that linear sense yeah you know i just think it's just still so hypothetical the information's released you know i'm still I'm still maintaining like an eight in overall excitement about the car, but it is one of those things, the details, the particulars, we just want to get hands on at this point. We yeah. want to get something in front of our face, get something to watch, you know, get an idea what we, what, uh, especially from a consumer level at what people can get their hands on. They also announced that they're going to have two shifting levers. So not just your park neutral and drive, you're going to have a second one for two wheel drive, four wheel drive, and then locked differentials. Um, which with their, uh, their gearing, they're going to have dogged gears and, uh, theoretically they're going to allow you to shift on the fly as well. So, um, if, if they can, they've been a little bit sketchy on if they're actually going to make that happen or not, but if they do make that happen, having a shift on the fly into four wheel and into a locked diff would be a huge win for anyone doing rock crawling or racing, uh, in the desert. Right. No, I would agree with that. No question about it. Um, the other part of that is you're doing a physical linkage versus an electronic switch, which means that you're not going to be limited to like the five mile an hour thing, um, that you would see on normal, um, Polaris's or Can-Am's. So, uh, 
not relying on electronics to shift you into a into an all-wheel drive mode and going to a, and a physical four uh, wheel drive is is going to be a huge win. Uh, something they've also said is that they're going to have a larger input shaft with larger bearing, uh, which if you're going to actually be getting 300 plus horsepower out of this thing, that's going to be needed, right? They're going to also going to have wider drive gears. So if you look at the actual drive shaft inside the transmission, uh, the face of the drive gears uh, translating the power from um, the crank to the to the actual gearbox is going to be two to two and a half times the face size on the gearing. So you're you're going to have a lot more surface to translate the power down to to the wheels, which will be great. So. You, I, I wasn't able to watch the presser. You were, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you got to see it, right? The the Robbie Gordon transmission? Yeah, the the uh, basically he did like a webinar or yep, something yep. like that on from Facebook. From his garage, yep. Yeah, how much of that came out uh, by way of questionnaires from people that were watching and how much of it was uh, part of the presentation? Yeah, so he always starts with a Q&A from the previous week. Um, and there were some good questions that came up about um, the axles and the CV joints, uh, things like that, uh, and the front diff. Uh, the the actual gearbox uh, was all brought by him, but he didn't really go into like a large amount of detail on, like I said, the cruise mode or uh, if the um, the shift on the fly was actually going to come to market. He, he was very um, shy shy away from actual details on that. But um, but yeah, he was he had actual parts on his counter for the the drive the drive line and the and the cv joints and and all that kind of stuff so he was prepared to to show that stuff off but it wasn't his stuff it was the competitor stuff um the only thing that he showed physically that was his was the cv um the the bearing carrier inside the the cv housing uh which is uh what is kind of interesting what they're doing is that the the bearing carriage is actually traveling through the cup versus staying static and the movement in the axle uh, will be moving on the on the bearing instead of on the splines of the axle. So most guys that break their axles off at the splines are doing it because the, there's too much torque on the narrowest part of that of that cup, which is the splines. And um, he showed how uh, on a previous race, one of his racers had had done that exact thing, sheared off the splines, um, and that theoretically wouldn't happen on this type of setup where he has um, the moving bearing. Now, what the reason that's important is because they're going to have a locked width of wheel travel when the car is in full droop to full compression. So when the when the width is at the 77 inches at, uh, at standing width, uh, it's going to be close to that at basically full droop or full compression. So uh, having uh, the wide uh, trailing arms that is important because you don't have the trailing arm coming in and out with the arc of the of the travel and uh you need that axle to actually move in and out and that's how they're going to accomplish that so have you uh put down your deposit yet um if i could afford to bring that unit in-house for demonstration and and creating content for our viewers uh, i would definitely do that but that's a large chunk of change uh to be responsible for in the next months yeah, I've seen some. Uh, I, I know there's one up in the uh, Arlington, Washington area. I want to say it is. It may very well be parked at Octane Toy Box right now as we speak. So I get to see some Instagram updates on that every now and again, and uh, it's it's a good looking car. It's hot. I uh, can't say I don't want to go play with it. Well, you're referring to their current version of the 4X, which is based Correct. off the Textron XX platform, right? Right, right. And so that does have a lot of upgrades, but it is the Textron at heart, and it's not their new engine, their new system altogether. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that took, they just recently took delivery out of it, if I remember correctly. I want to say it's probably within the last two to three months, somewhere in there. So it hasn't been on site very long. So Yeah, those are cool cars. They're, they're pro-charged and um, have a lot of power and a lot of torque um, at the ready. So it'd be fun to, to take one out for a spin, for sure. I'll see how uh, see how good of a salesman I am to see if we can get behind the wheel of one <laughs> once, it, once all these restrictions are off. I dig it. So uh, just to wrap up that uh, information cycle on Speed UTV, they also announced that they're going to be making a custom Speed UTV tire uh, through what they said one of their tire partners. So they haven't specified who's making it yet or what the compounds will be or the ply ratings or anything like that. But they've designed it to have the Speed S logo as the tread pattern. So if you think about maybe something like the, uh, the Fuel uh, tires where they have the F logo as their tread pattern, um, he's thinking about doing the same thing where the S logo is your tread lugs. Gotcha. 
So uh, to move on, we also, uh, I, I, in the news cycle, um, I saw that the uh, Mahindra Roxor um, side-by-side truck thing um, has finally changed away from the Jeep grill uh, to avoid the lawsuits and have gone to a new custom grill. Um, but uh, I saw that and it made me think about how um, everybody was kind of concerned about them coming into the UTV market and trying to, you know, muddy up the waters, so to speak. But I think it's kind of fair to say that um, I can officially call them not a side-by-side or not a UTV. They are a small form truck. Yeah, I I would agree with that. In terms of their overall impact, though, uh, I'm going to be in the next few months introducing you to some people that work for a company up in Spokane, Washington, that uh, do a lot of off-road support, do a lot of support for the UTV industry. And I want to say that and if their metrics are still accurate, it's something to the tune of about 70% of their overall uh, volume related to off-road components is for the Mahindra. It's a it's very, very popular car. Yeah, I would definitely love to see some numbers from a manufacturer that has insight into the volume um, of unit sales and unit usage. Uh, but I still wouldn't consider them a part of the UTV market. I mean... No, they, I wouldn't either. I, I may... I may have some leniency to say that they're part of the um, utility vehicle market if you're using it on the farm and stuff, but I still would lump it into the small form factor truck, kind of like a small Toyota or a, something like that. Yeah, th- th- to the best of my knowledge, or at least uh, when I saw eyes on, which is about a year ago, I actually got to drive one. I don't even think they were street legal at the time. I'm, somebody will tell me I'm wrong there, but I, I, I could have swore they weren't. Yeah, they're not street legal from the factory uh, for any jurisdiction, I don't think. Um, but they do have, you know, just like any other UTV, uh, a series of steps that you can go through to get them certified for the road. Um, and I've seen them certified in places where they drive them on the freeway, too. So, um, yeah, I've seen some people employ some tricks in order to get stuff street legal. Uh, the most recent one was a, a Suzuki Samurai that was mounted on a Turbo S frame. And because the Samurai retained its VIN, uh, yep. they were driving it legally on the street. So the X3 is going to get a Ford Ranger body. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think maybe we should get you one of those uh, one of those fiberglass um, Pro Runner. Kit. Yeah, yeah, one of those little mini truck kits. That would be it, super sick. Know, Let's give it a couple of years. Let's pay all the bills, and then uh, let's get crazy. <laughs> yeah, let's 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 let you settle into the machine and get a little bored, so we can upgrade it to something fancy. Uh, that's right. Um, so, anyways, I just it was something that was in the back of my head. I was just thinking how there was a big uproar about these coming to market a couple of years ago, and since then, no one really has talked about them since. And I think they're uh, only getting popular in the um, the farms and the uh, like the lake house type scenarios where you just drive into the to the local grill or bar or whatever, and and then back to the house. Yeah, their off road capability might be there in some aspects, but not for the type of riding that we're doing. You know, I, I mean, even hearing the word Mahindra makes my back hurt from a little <laughs> test drive I took out in Virginia. Have you ever seen one on the dunes? Never. I would be super interested to see anyone that's got those things tuned to work on the dunes. That'd be pretty oh, I'd cool. give it a try. What, what the heck? <laughs> Moving on to uh, COVID, how are you? Uh, how are you guys doing over there? We got uh, you know our kids here doing the um, the homeschooling, and the wife uh, she ha- owns a salon, and they've shut us us down. So she's basically uh, not been doing much, and recently started going back to college. So she's studying to be an RA. Yeah, so so like we were like I was saying, I, I'm starting to get a little bit more active uh, related to work, get out a little bit more, and uh, you know we're, we're starting to see obviously on the news right now. Uh, People, people are losing a little bit of patience. Um, as far as how we're doing, we're still doing good, still doing healthy, uh, still healthy. But I can tell you, uh, I have parts showing up for this Can Am on the daily. If it isn't for can, if it isn't a direct part that's going onto my car, it's some sort of support part for our endeavors like camping, um, wenching. I've gotten uh, all kinds of goodies that have shown up. So uh, I, I did talk to the the cage builder yesterday. Got to do some sizing, and that thing should be back in uh, the side by side guy's possession in about two weeks. At which point. We're going to go crazy on my 500 acres and <laughs> uh, rock. I might have to rein you in a little bit to keep you safe. Well, we're gonna. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna. <laughs> um, 
we're, we're going to let that thing kind of cut its own tracks and stuff. I, I've been uh, probably might wind up renting a tractor with a skid or something like that to, to drag behind, maybe even a heavy disc or something. And um, I've got kind of the first, I would say probably quarter mile to three quarters of a mile in my head about how I want to do it. But the ultimate goal is to actually have a very speed centric track, not an obstacle track, because as you know, you've ridden out here, there's plenty of obstacles and we can go do that anytime we want. But from a speed standpoint, I want, I want three and a half miles and that's totally doable out here. So, uh, we're going to get busy for sure. (laughs) Yeah. I think there's definitely a possibility with that chunk of land that we've talked about, um, doing something where there's, uh, maybe some speed loops and then some alternate legs that maybe are a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be cool to get yeah, the, the uh, drone out there and do uh, some aerial stuff and then and plot it all out. You know, you want to get you want to get super weird, man. Let's uh, let's get our overland kit set up on our cars and stuff, and just go out into my back forty and camp it out and make sure that we have <laughs> everything that we need and everybody's comfortable. I, I mean, the heck with it. You know, when the kids tell me they want to go camping, you know, the default response from a parent is, uh, "Well, go get the tent and go in the backyard and satisfy your itch." Uh, I think that's the equivalent I've, of the of the grown up. Uh, I want to get out and and ride. You know, I've camped all over the Pacific Northwest off of a UTV, and I, I got to say, probably camping off of my on my, our farm is probably as dangerous or more dangerous than anywhere <laughs> I've camped. I mean, I've got I've got cougar on trail cam out here, and uh, there's I mean, coyotes aren't a threat or anything like that, unless you're from California and you believe that. But <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we've got cats on camera, uh, so yeah, you definitely want to have a head on a swivel out in my neck of the woods. But you know, you it's not cats, it's moose. Those things are territorial and temperamental. They don't like uh, they don't like people. You get moose over at your place? Oh yeah, yeah. I almost uh, within a mile of the house, I almost hit one the other day. Oh wow. Yeah. So uh, I'm probably gonna make a video on this uh, in the garage just because of uh, you know the, the times we're in. But uh, I kind of came up with this five things to do in the garage while you're stuck at home uh, in relation to uh, all the UTV owners out there that are clawing at the walls to get outside. Um, and so I kind of came up with these five things and it, it starts off with this idea of just cleaning your flipping space and your tools. Uh, how many times have we always said that I'll get, I'll get to the garage and I'll clean it later. I'll organize later. Like this is the perfect time to get your tools in order, get things cleaned up and make your life easier by, uh, by visiting those things that you've put off for so long. Um, I recently did that. I had a whole corner of the garage that was just piling up with stuff. I was thinking to myself, I'll get to that later when I have time. And you know what? When you have nothing but time, the best time to do it is then. Right. And it's funny that you wrote that in because you actually wrote that in as one of the last pieces. Um, I don't know what time it is right now. It's probably about 8, 830, somewhere in that ballpark at night. And within the last two hours, that's actually what I was doing in my, my uh, trailer. Yeah, I've got, I'm trying to get some stuff organized out for my trailer for a uh, show season because people are getting pretty optimistic about what's going to happen. I'm not a hundred percent sure where all that's going to line out, but, uh, yeah, I'm, there's some, there's some woodworking projects and stuff I want to get involved in on my trailer. And, uh, but in terms of getting my tools organized, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. We actually had a, a follower, uh, send us some pictures cause that inspired them last time we were talking about the trailer. Uh, And they just put down some fold down beds and whatnot in their trailers as well. Um, Kind of doing the same thing that we were talking about uh, on our trip to Oregon, where uh, making the trailer more usable and friendly to doing on site, uh, on location camping and things like that through the trailer once you're unloaded. So, yeah, uh, I, 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 my, uh, my workflow and stuff as it pertains to full throttle battery is, uh, it's pretty dialed. You know, I'm pretty proud of it. I've, I've got, my my layout done really really well and then i'll just look at kind of like the rest of my life (laughs) regarding off-road and some somewhat chaotic lately i'm just like nah i'm not having it so i uh, i've spent the i spent the weekend kind of trying to dial some of that stuff up second thing on my list of five things you can do in the garage while you're stuck inside is clean your utv and and when i say that i'm not talking about taking it outside and pressure washing it um, I'm talking about actually taking the time to pull the seats out, pull the harnesses off, you know, pull the top plastics off, get underneath where everything hides. Um, I remember the last time I did this, uh, we had gone through some mud at our local ORV park 
and really had tore it up something fierce. And there was mud in places that you would never even imagine they could possibly get to. Um, and mud gets into your skid plates, into your undercarriage, into your motor uh, mounting areas, and can actually add another, you know, 50 to 100 pounds of weight without even knowing it. And so getting in the t- in, into all those nooks and crevices to get your machine clean um, will actually provide you a better riding experience when you know that you've gotten all the excess weight off the machine. It's good stuff. Uh, and my third item was to change your uh, fluids and filters. So you're obviously going to be somebody, uh, if, you're, if you're working on UTVs, you're going to obviously have the idea in your head about preventative maintenance. Uh, but uh, something I was uh, just thinking about the other day was everybody talks about changing their oil, changing their filters to air filters, uh, but no one really talks about changing their diff fluid. Uh, in your user manual for your machine, there is a service period for your front and rear diff fluids. And a lot of times uh, people change them because they mistakenly open up the diff instead of the oil pan. Uh, and so they get a different color of fluid coming out and they're wondering why. But uh, uh, do it on purpose instead of on accident. Change your diff fluids according to your ske- your scheduled maintenance and you're going to prolong the life of your diff. Um, and number four was to disassemble your suspension and check the components. So the idea behind this is that most times owners of UTVs will take time to uh, check their oil or check their air filters or, um, you know, check the, the tire wear on the on the tires, but they don't really ever take time to inspect their suspension until it's too late. Um, and so if you take the time to take the wheels off, inspect your hubs, grease your wheel bearings, and inspect your suspension components and the seals on your, on your shocks, uh, knowing that they're starting to leak or to give out, um, ahead of time is going to save you long run from investing in a whole new shock or a whole new system um, or possibly even keep you safe because you're preventing an accident from happening. A lot of guys don't take the time to wheel uh, add grease to their wheel bearings often enough. Um, and uh, we do our wheels um, on our razor, I would say probably every second or third ride, uh, depending if we're getting uh, submerged or not. If we're getting really wet, we'll do it every other ride or every ride after that. So um, take the time to grease your wheels, check your, uh, seals on your shocks. They shouldn't be leaking. You should never have a buildup of wet, uh, dirt around the, the gaskets. And if you do, then you know, you need to start looking into a service on a new seal kit. Um, possibly if your machine's older, uh, our turbo, uh, razor is uh, 2016. Um, those, those components inside, they wear out and they start to leak and they give out and you need to, to make sure you're doing the maintenance you need to do on those. And then uh, finally, our last point on the five things to do in the garage while you're stuck inside during this COVID outbreak is to finally do it and do it right. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of projects on our UTVs um, that we do in a hurry. So like if we're going out for a weekend, a lot of times we will uh, take a moment to uh, install a light or a light bar or a sound system or something, some accessory on the machine. And uh, a lot of times it's in a hurry, it's late at night, maybe a couple beers or whatever, and uh, you end up just getting it installed, you just kind of rat nest all the wires together, zip tie them to the frame and call it good. This is the perfect time to actually take it all apart, redo it, clean it, inspect it, do it correctly, trim your wires, and put things away nicely so that they actually last the length of the vehicle versus the the temporary install you did uh, initially. So right now I know that in our razor we got a bunch of uh, uh, well kept wiring uh, nests, but they're not uh, they're not pretty, and they're not um, they're not in a a reusable way if you if you can think of it that way. A lot of things that were crimped together or soldered together, uh, nothing done with um, crimped ends and things like that. So uh, that's a be that's actually going to be a video here coming up soon. Uh, I'm going to be taking apart the razor and building a whole new wiring harness for it. And I'm actually thinking about building on some extra capacity on the machine to do testing, product testing uh, coming up this fall or in this summer, hopefully, if we can get out of the house. Um, but the idea about crimping on additional uh, capacity for additional lights or different accessories we can compare. We've talked a little bit about going up to the, uh, the woods and tech, uh, testing lights and light throw and uh, performance under conditions, things like that, and having um, you know pigtails to plug in, in and out different lights and things like that would be a huge... Uh, um, ease of burden on uh, testing products for us. For sure. And then we got a wiring job to do on your machine as soon as you get that back, right? Well, we got a lot to do on that thing. I've got, <clears throat> I've still got a few things that I need to get ordered in. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got 
should we just go down the list? Sure. Why got not? a handful of things. We've got uh, we got the immediate things to because we've got a, we've got some rides coming up. Is uh, lights and communications, and yep. so we've got the six. Want to let the cat out of the bag because you got a video doing the, uh, <laughs> so the unveil. Let's just on say it. that uh, I have a video coming out this week, so we're recording uh, April twenty first uh, in the evening, and we're going to be launching this video probably on Wednesday the twenty second. Uh, it's the first look at the Baja Designs uh, Onyx Six Plus Light Bar and uh, RTL Chase Bar. So the Onyx Six Plus Light Bar is a ten inch light bar with a six chip LEDs. And you're going to be mounting that to your shock tower on the X3RC. You know, one of the the cool things that I going through the specifications about that light that really kind of intrigued me was I experienced on my YXZ, I experienced some flicker, uh, some light flicker. And it was because my stator couldn't power that, that light bar enough. And they've remedied that on this particular model. So I'm really looking forward to that. But, you know, as it pertains to this light setup, there's a couple of products that are on back order that'll show up probably in the next month or two, somewhere in that ballpark. But I went to a gentleman by the name of Chris Johnson and Chris Johnson is the, um, he's a engineer, one of the top engineers at Baja Designs. And I just told him, I said, okay, so this is what the, this is what the X3 is working with from a power standpoint. This is what I'm upgrading from a power standpoint. I want the definitive X3 kit based on uh, power consumption and how much light it can generate. And I told him, I go, I think this is it. Like, I think that the, uh, basically I was just asking him, like, tell, tell me if I'm wrong here. And he made a couple of suggestions and I think we have it. And this is, it's going to look a little different than most car, most cars because I'm not running a light bar up top. Everything's below the eye level. And that's, that was done purposely. So, uh, so we're running that six plus and you currently, at least I still, I hope you do, you still have my S1 kit on my, uh, uh, f- basically we're replacing the headlight kit with the S1 kit. We're doing uh, two LP4s on the front. And the more I think about it, because they're coming in amber, I might actually bring them in clear. I don't know. I mean, the opportunity where I would need an amber lens is pretty far and f- uh, few and far between. It's, uh, I mean... Are you saying you're you're gonna lead the pack instead of follow the pack, Ian? Well, we that's usually how it is. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so but nonetheless, uh, I, I'm really confident in what they built uh, f- for this for this particular car, and I'm really looking forward to putting it on the machine. No doubt about it. Yeah. So the the LP4 is our back order, I think, is what you said, and, and the S1 yeah. kit is here. I'm gonna do a video on that kit as well. Um, and then eventually, I can, I can tell you one thing that I'm really kicking around right now, though, is on the X, on the YXE, I had something at the pod level, and what they were is they were those Sector Seven lights, and those things were fantastic. Those are it's amazing pheno- lights. Oh, it's a phenomenal mirror. The best mirror I've ever seen in UTV is on that Sector Seven light, yep. and it just so happens to have a great flood pattern as well. Yep, and. I, I'm trying to figure something out in that regard because obviously I have to have mirrors in order to qualify for being street legal, but I also am thinking about potentially putting some light out there. So I'm thinking to myself, do I just, do I just do another mirror and put like another LP4 up on that pillar or not? So I'm just kind of kicking around a few things, but we, we got to see what this is going to put out first. Yeah. The, you're going to have a complete S1 replacement kit plus the LP4s plus the Onyx 6 plus you're going to have that Onyx 6 plus does not over 9,000 lumen on low and over 12,000 lumen on high. Uh, that's so I know people who run it. It is. I know people who run it, and uh, one of one of the guys that runs it is a buddy of mine that owns an off road safety component company, and he has a sixty four inch X three. So I hit him up, and I was asking him like, how how does that thing functions for you? And all he sent back was an emoji of uh, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec doing this goofy dance. <laughs> so I assume that's really good. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting that on there. And we're going to do, you know, we're going to throw the drone up probably about uh, 400 feet, 350, 400 feet. And we'll throw the stock headlights out on a very, very dark night out behind my farm. I've got this spot where you can stretch out about a mile. Um, 
and then we'll throw the S1s on and do a copper, uh, uh, basically a comparison between the stock headlights and the S1 conversion kit. So right. I'm really looking forward to seeing how the difference is. And the nice thing about the Baja Designs uh, light components is that they're all uh, lens replaceable. So you can take the front yeah. shroud off, put a different lens into it, and that includes clear to amber or amber to clear. And that also includes spot to flood and, and combination. So, uh, for instance, your, your Onyx 6 Plus comes with a, uh, a combo lens where the center four chips are a spot four to, uh, six degree throw and your outside uh, lenses are a wide, um, I think it's like a 60 degree throw or something like that. Right. Um, and so that's a great solution. Uh, in the combo scenario, uh, but you may be doing something more specific where you need to have all spot or all flood. And, um, and so that's one thing that's nice about that. You can actually keep a, a kit of lenses in the garage and uh, change them out per the application or wherever you're riding. So if you're doing a lot of trail where you're doing a lot of uh, switchbacks and things where you, you don't really benefit from a spot per se, um, you could put the combo or a flood lens on there and get more of a scene light uh, where you can see all the trees and possible animals that might be jumping out, things like that. Um, but if you're out in the desert and you're going to be doing long runs, you could throw the spot on there and keep the light all facing forward. Um, For sure. So all the light kits that you got from, coming from Baja um, are going to look great. They're going to put out a ton of great light forward. And so you were saying, considering the the, the um, Sector 7 mirrors, um, that's going to be really important when you want to do uh, side lighting where you need to see next to you versus in front of For you. For sure. And um, so if anyone out there is considering light upgrades, things like that, uh, there's really no better solution for the side lighting um, unless you've got a cage where you can put pods all the way around your machine. Um, the Sector 7s really kill it. Um, I think they go a little bit further back than 180 degrees. Um, and then it's just a ton of... It's like it's the essential. It's essentially four like rigid uh, DR D twos or something like that, all pointing to the side. It's just a ton of light. Yeah, I there's we could dedicate an episode to those lights. I mean, I'm telling you, on my YXE, I was hitting tree branches at 70 miles an hour, and they didn't. They showed nowhere. They were they were so unbelievably tough. Yeah. Within the last three to four working days, I've had a conversation with uh, the owner of the company. He's a good gentleman by the name of Lynn, really good guy. Yep. As a matter of fact, Lynn and I went and saw Mount Rushmore together <laughs> when we were down in Sturgis for this off-road show. But uh, uh, I sent him a message asking him if it would be possible if I could get them in a custom color. So we we are kind of kicking it around <laughs> a little bit. They, they might wind up on the car. I, I could, But I can tell you there's just... They check off so many boxes. They're yep. so tough. They're so durable. They're they're heavy. They're beefy. I mean, if they hit a tree, that tree is going to bleed, basically. Yeah. And they have the best convex viewing surface in the industry. I don't, I don't think there's a mirror out there that competes with them in the viewable surface. None that I've seen. Yeah. None that I've seen. I, I've just, they, they're, they're so impressive. Like, like I said, uh, when I got mine, it was at SEMA last year. And he put them on my car before I even showed up to the event. And he gives me a phone call and he was like, Hey, is there anything else that, uh, that you want? Or, and I basically told him, I'm just like, why don't you just throw some brochures, maybe throw like 50 to hundred brochures or something like that on the passenger seat of the car. And the mirrors got just as much attention as the car did. For sure. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. They're, they're, they're fantastic. Yeah, definitely a great product, and they have a lot of great other products for dirt bikes, and and now they're adding more accessories for the UTV market as well. Uh, so if let's you haven't, put, let's just put it this way: I've spent time on their website to make sure that I know everything that he offers, everything that he builds, and figuring out like if it's something that I have a need for on my car, that's where I'm calling because. I mean, you know what you're getting. You have you have his fire extinguisher mount on your rig, and and it's just it's flawless. There, there honestly is very few products that compete at that level, and uh, yeah, they're they're leading the way in in that product segment. Then, then we got uh, you got my other toy sitting on your uh, sitting on your bench. You know the the radio oh, kit so that I've been we, we, trying uh, to inspire you to put into your car. <laughs> yeah, so we're looking at the future uh, when and, and the need for comms between the cars and and people out filming and things like that. So uh, obviously the go to choice is rugged radios, uh, a leader in the industry side by side industry for communications. Um, and so you've you've put a full sixty watt kit uh, on order for your car, uh, and that includes a, a dash mount and all that. 
but we have that unit here in the shop to do a first look video uh, and walk around as well. So uh, we're gonna take a look at that and then as soon as we get your car in, we're gonna install that and we're looking to do the same on the on our turbo uh, razor. And so we're gonna have a good solid communications platform that we can also expand to the individuals with the handhelds. And uh, for the overlanding that we're gonna be doing, we can go far, far between and not lose communications, but also uh, just going top of mountain to bottom of mountain and being able to communicate uh, to the filmers think, and things like that will be will be awesome. For, for sure. I think by this time next year, we're going to have a 60 watt in your car, a 60 watt in my car. Uh, Ben's already got a set up in his YXC and we'll probably have a home base in my trailer as well. I just, once you've, once you know what it's like to have immediate access, immediate communication with the people that you're riding with. A lot of people determine that that's their first modification on their next car. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so critical. One of the nice things about those head units uh, is they also have an audio out, so you can record to a recorder. Uh, so yeah. you can throw some sort of recording device into the into the glove box or whatever, and you can record your conversations back and forth, which is a really cool concept. Uh, if you're you know somebody that likes to make little vlog videos and things like that of your rides, um, that's yeah. a great option for you to do. You can pick up a digital recorder on Amazon for fairly cheap. Um, well, and if you don't mind exposing a port on your GoPro, the newer GoPros, you can plug directly into it. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, the GoPro itself will record your, the audio track. Record yeah, the, so if you have a 7, you can get the audio adapter, which requires a side door to be open. And then the yeah. Hero 8 has a media mod. Uh, which again takes away the weatherproofness as well, but uh, allows you to plug in um, a dedicated microphone as well. So, so if you're leading the way like me, totally doable. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not raining as long as you're not plunging, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that looks like a lot of fun. We're gonna make some content around that as well, and then once we get the car back in the shop, we will do the installs and the wiring and and bring you all along for that as well. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to also take these units out to uh, some fields and to some mountains and do some uh, range comparisons to see what these radios can do as far as quality and uh, distance in the hills and then in open flats and things like that so that people really have a good idea of the performance of these things um, in real case scenarios. Yeah, I want to know uh, 60 watt to 60 watt. I want to know how far that's going to stretch. And I've got some spots where you can really test that out. You know, the town that I actually live in, the zip code that I live in, I live eight miles from that town and it's a straight line. So we could we could easily test stuff like that. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun to really get out this season and, and actually start to do a lot of this uh, stuff that we've been talking about. Well, before the trips start taking place, we got to do some riding out here at my neck of the woods anyway, just to get an idea how much, what kind of fuel capacity that uh, we're going to be able to pull off. That's something you have to know when you're out on the backcountry. Yeah, especially when you start doing modifications to the machines, including, you know, uh, adding components, changes to, to the cages, things like that, where you're changing the weight distribution of the car, along with, uh, you know, just the additional weight of components that you're taking for your trip. So if you're taking food, um, shelter, things like that on the car, it all it all changes, and, and including ECU mapping, things like the Evo Stage uh, 3 that you've right. got on yours. So. Um, all those things come into play and they change the, the, the total spectrum of range that you get out of your vehicle. So, uh, we're going well, to have the to other thing, that. you know, the, I, I didn't tell you this, but I, I inadvertently bought you and Ben a wonderful present. Um, <laughs> oh, I got really? you, I got you. Oh yeah. I got you guys a, uh, uh, it's either a four or five gallon roto packs. It's oh. one of the long ones and it'll mount just perfectly across the back of your cage. And uh, I bought it for you because it would not fit on my car. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so you're we were gifting, uh, huh? Yeah, we are regifting. Yeah. And I bought, <laughs> I bought it with the antenna putting it on the cage in the X3 and it was just apparent that it just wasn't going to work. Um, so I found a fantastic solution. Yeah. Uh, assuming it works, but, uh, I don't have my hands on it. I haven't ordered it yet, but I plan on doing so. So it's a, um, there's a company called Giant Loop. There's companies called Wolfman, Giant Loop, Moscow Moto, Big Agnes uh, from my days on two wheels, from my days on motorcycles. They make awesome like luggage type components for enduro riders and dual sport riders. Well, this, uh, this company Giant Loops makes fuel bladders. And I've seen no shortage of videos on YouTube of guys running these fuel bladders over with their full-size Chevy pickups, dragging them behind Toyotas. They're very, very durable. They're small. They take up no space. And you can get your hands on them from one gallon up to five. So my plan is to run two fives. Where we're going to put them, I don't know. But I know <laughs> we're going to put them somewhere. So I've always been curious why nobody's made a glove box fuel tank 
for these for these rides because it seems like such an easy place to store another you know four or five gallons of fuel um without any impact to your creature comforts within the car um yeah you know the x3 uh the x3 i've seen no shortage of guys out there building x uh auxiliary fuel tanks for these things i mean there's one guy that claims that he has a 15 and another guy has an 18 gallon tank you should see how much they want for them though they're like (laughs) three grand 3500 and you know if i can make something like this giant loop system work i think it's going to be a really good it's going to be a stressful problem solved for me you know with my flash i've i've had people tell me that it really hadn't affected their fuel mileage too much because they have the capability to keep their foot out of it then i've had people tell me that their fuel consumption was up to the tune of about 30 40% more so it's concerning but we'll get to the bottom of it yeah it's it's definitely going to have a lot to do with how how far your foot goes into the floor uh for the extended amounts of time so and if I got to run the thing in eco mode, so be it. You know, the thing still goes really well in eco mode. For sure. And a lot of the yeah. a lot of the traveling we're going to do, you're not going to necessarily be doing dune speeds um, for extended amounts of time. So um, absolutely, it'll, it'll be an interesting uh, performance metric to, to come away with. Oh, do you want to hear about the other goodies that just showed up recently? More, geez, <laughs> Santa Claus, what do you got going on oh, over there? What, what don't I have showing up? I, I had a, I had a MyMedic kit show up, which I dug. I dove into that. Nice. It is fan. It, dude, it is fantastic. I mean the the only thing the only thing that I thought that was missing from I mean, honestly, there really wasn't anything missing from that kit that I could think, like a like a pressure syringe. You know, I, I'm not I'm not first aid certified or anything like that, but a lot of people employ like a syringe with a uh, a certain gauge tip mm-hmm. that'll apply so that you can basically take fresh water and clean out a wound in the event that somebody had an injury. But I went right. through that med kit and it had everything, and uh, uh, so I've got that my medic kit. I got to tell you, dude. I've never been more excited about just a freaking <laughs> winch mount. Like I like my I got my uh, oh, close you got shackle the factor, factor uh, 55 50 55 oh. link in there, didn't you? S- s- say it again, only a little bit slower. <laughs> little, oh. Yeah. I, oh, I tell I'm you so what, as far that. as knocking it out of the park, factor 55 is probably so far seated into my heart for just how Dude, awesome how do you make, a, make How do you make a hook sexy? They managed to <laughs> do it. it blue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I got uh, so I've got like max tie down uh, the tri strap that goes over the back for the spare tire. I've got max tie to uh, max max tie down and um, uh, rigging. I uh, got a rigging strap from them. I got uh, a toe strap from them. The goodies just keep showing up, buddy. I'm 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 pumped. I like so. Riding so here's the problem, Ian. <laughs> you don't have the car at your place, and you're getting goodies. I and I have the car at my place, and I'm not getting goodies. What is wrong with this picture? I think we need to fix this. I'll just let you. I'll let you borrow my wife's credit card. <laughs> so. you, you know, you and I. I, I honestly think we got to tear apart this uh, this my medic kit. We could probably do a five minute video on it. Let's tear apart that my medic kit. Like I said, the only thing that I thought that it was missing was that, and uh, it has like one Israeli strap, Israeli bandage. So I wound up buying like a three more. But outside of that, man, I mean, it was ninety nine bucks. Which I mean, some people might think that's a lot, but when we tear this thing apart and show it to you, it is legit. I, I I'm really excited to show it to you. It's it, it, they they really nailed it. What kind of case does that come in? It is a. Uh, it's a soft case. Eh, I'm not going to reach for it. It's behind my computer, but <laughs> it's a, it's like a, a molly soft bag. case. With, it's got a molly, it's a molly front molly bag. Um, uh, it doesn't have like a water filtration straw in it. And I've seen guys attach a water filtration straw to the side of it. So if you get an upgraded kit from the one that I got, it actually comes with that. Yeah. So I wound up just buying that filtration straw off Amazon and I'll just put it onto that kit. But no, I'm, I'm excited for you to take a look at it. There really wasn't, cause I've watched some videos on some, on some pros and, uh, the kit that they had the only thing that was missing from my kit that they had in their kit was, was decompression. Uh, basically those things like when guys have 
I don't, dude, I don't even want. I, I, I'm <laughs> so out, underqualified to be talking about this, but you're talking about those needles that they jam into your chest to to decompress your chest. Um, that's yeah. the only thing it's missing. And, and and if you have one of those in your med kit, that's not for your buddy. That's for you <laughs> in the event that you need one. Because uh, don't int- don't try and use one of those unless you really know and you, what you're and doing. And you need to be trained on something like that. That's not 100%. something you just go into willy nilly and and think well, you're gonna get away and, with it. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of uh, kind of keeping yourself busy with what's been going on, I've been looking at, uh, and I, I wanted to run this by you, but I want to go get us trained up, uh, basically be wilderness first responders. Yeah, and, so we've and we talked, can take that class at the local college. We've talked a little bit about wanting to do uh, some backcountry um, emergency scenario type uh, content and and talk to some some uh, EMTs and, and things like that that can give us some insight into how to go into the backwoods or, or these overlanding trips prepared. Um, and I don't think it's anything out of reality to that says you should be trained on how to survive an emergency um, if you're going out for a long extended trip. I think, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a couple different classes you can take. It's like remote first aid and then there's wilderness first responder. And that's a pretty serious endorsement. That's about a 10-day class. And, uh, you know, one one show that I love watching, I've watched it for years, years, <laughs> is uh, Expedition Overland. And it's on Prime and it's on YouTube. I've, I've watched that show pretty religiously. I want to say every single person that's in one of those vehicles is trained. It's It's got a lot of value. If you're going, like I said, if you're going out for more than just an overnight camp or something like that, it really um, is an important thing to think about to have somebody in your crew that's going out that can be prepared to handle a situation in a high stress situation where you have a compound fracture or if you have um, a life threatening injury, uh, how to handle that in an appropriate way and get them back to safety. Or if you maybe need to radio out for help and have emergency crews come get you, um, having somebody trained and have the knowledge uh, is going to probably save somebody's life uh, someday if you're in these kind of trips and scenarios frequently. Yeah, you want to be, you know, it would be great to have somebody with a skill set to be able to stabilize as opposed to just do a patch job and then you're just on the clock to get them to a hospital. Because I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, we haven't talked about some of the runs that we're going to be doing, but there's going to be times where we're going to be 10 hours. To, you know, the only way that somebody be able to access us, I don't even know if they get to us with a helicopter. Right. You know, we'd have to go to a small town that has an airstrip and it have to come in with a plane, like a little bush plane or something, and, which is a real thing in Idaho. And you know? the thing to remember is that where you might be five, 10 miles out as the bird flies, like that quadruples when you're talking about switchbacks and trails uh, when you actually have to drive it. So um, if you're 10, 15 miles away from any kind of civilization, you're going to be at least 30 to 50 miles um, by land. So, um, it's a good thing you guys got a Chad, man. Somebody <laughs> has like an arm amputation or something. We're going to put that back on you. <laughs> we got duct tape. So, That's right. Uh, yeah. I really look forward to seeing what you got in that kit and, and maybe dissecting, see that pun dissecting, uh, dissecting. the, uh, the kit and seeing what it's got going for it and maybe getting some, uh, EMTs on the podcast to kind of speak towards, yeah. uh, that safety and, and the different things to look for in a kit. Let's get a let's get a guy certified wilderness first first responder. I think that would be it's, kind of a cool legit. video to do a yeah. um, you know introduction to off road safety and, and going through a class and takeaways and things like that. That'd be a that'd be a pretty cool video. Let's write it up. I dig it. And so speaking of videos, uh, we're working to uh, bring on board some partners that are maybe dealerships or OEs or um, equipment other equipment manufacturers to do uh, product videos specific to, um, you know, different units and different uh, product market sets. Uh, and so I had a couple meetings this week with a dealer here locally that um, hopefully will uh, result in um, some pretty cool uh, content and a lot more volume of machines. So instead of being stuck on R2 machines, maybe having some hands-on experience with some other uh, manufacturers and models. And uh, that also includes uh, non-sport specific models as well. So um really looking forward to getting my hands on to um, maybe some of these other machines that we don't really talk about so much, maybe some defenders or pioneers or um, some mules or um, uh, rangers, things like that to where it's not just necessarily all just sports and, and extreme sport machines. It's, it's all the UTVs in the market. 
Yeah, we want to talk about the Maverick Sports of the world. We want to talk about the Terexes. And uh, I think, you know, I, I, I know who you're you're talking with and man they got it they check a huge bunch of, they check a lot off that list It'd yeah be great It'd be great yeah they have just stuff. about every uh model uh make and model that we would uh be looking to touch uh you know in the near future so um really looking forward to developing that relationship and seeing where that takes us um and uh, we're doing it in a way that benefits them not only us and so uh you guys can look forward to seeing some content around that um so as we continue into this uh, stay-at-home stuff uh, here in Washington, where we're based out of, our governor pretty much just said, uh, kind of laughed at the idea of, of lifting the bans uh, early May. So uh, we're looking probably June before we get any kind of uh, open for business type stuff going on in our neck of the woods. Uh, so for all of you that are stuck inside, um, what kind of uh, shows are you watching and what kind of things are you interested to, to preoccupy your brain when you uh, have some downtime? So I've been watching, uh, as far, I'm, I'm just going to kind of keep it to YouTube and, and related to the industry. There's a, there's a few shows that I've picked up on lately. One of them's called, uh, I want to say the channel's called The Story Until Now. It is mainly, the, it's a gentleman that's based in BC. He has, a, I want to say it's a new Jeep Patriot build, and he does a lot of off-roading around the BC area, which is a place that I really want to wheel. Um, so I've been following that pretty closely. Expedition Overland's a huge one for me. It's huge. Like I, I, Expedition Overland has everything from tutorials down to trips. It's just fascinating. Those guys are just super passionate about what they do. I love that show. I always have. Um, I follow, uh, not too much dual sport stuff. There, there's one dual sport guy. There's one motorcycle guy that I love. It's called uh, Fort Nine. F O R T N I N E. Fort Nine is awesome. He's, he's another BC guy. He's hilarious. He, I mean, he'll test everything from a TW 200 up to a Ducati and uh, very good rider, technical rider. Um, that's a great show. As far as UTV goes, you know, a, a lot of times as it pertains to UTV, I'll follow, you know, everybody loves, we, we all love the side-by-side -side blog guys, uh, full throttle off-road. We love those guys. Um, I'm trying to think of what there was, a, there was another show that I was watching the other day, uh, related to UTV that I'm, I'm just, I'm not placing it, but it, you know, a lot of times what catches my eyes based on the title of the video, you know, you'll see a light comparison, you'll see a drag race or something and drag racing does nothing for me. It really, it never, really never has, but, uh, I like the guys that are going out there doing, you know, some, pretty seriously challenging rides going out and doing multi-day type stuff. That's the type of stuff that I look for. And unfortunately, as it relates to UTV, you and I are the only ones doing that. And, uh, I like to keep it that way. But <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we can't wait to get out this summer and, and actually start making some of this content to share with all the viewers. Uh, yeah. we have a lot of great ideas and a lot of great trips planned, um, that are in negotiations of time schedules according to our government. Let, but let me tell you, let me disclaim something really quick. Let me tell you about that Fortnite guy. Uh, that Fortnite guy's page, so much about adventure riding on a dirt bike and on a, or on a like a big BMW or a big KTM translates to what we do in UTV. So a lot of the gear that he tests will work fantastic in our applications. And that dude tests everything. Like he does, he did a dissertation on, uh, he did a dissertation on batteries and I, it made me mad how right he was. You know, he used pieces of crap <laughs> is the basis for his test but the actual uh chemistry the dissection and how he described it was really spot on he does dot helmet tests and stuff like that where he beats stuff up uh, he's basically the us of dual sport <laughs> right. so yeah it, so i mean like if you were wondering kind of uh like a coat or something that you wanted to try that that might be good for going on the outdoors and stuff there's a lot of sources out there for you know but you definitely kind of want to keep it to the power sport market for the guys that are using these type of things for similar applications. Yeah. So, uh, my boys, uh, I try to watch some TV with them to give them some, uh, time with me in a relaxed setting. And, uh, they've just discovered, um, America truck, uh, what's it called? Truck night in America, uh, on history with, um, the, with the uh, I love it. Uh, the recently deceased Pistol Pete, 
and it got me really kind of connected back to that whole race scene. And so uh, it was interesting because they have um, on the first season, I don't know about the second season, we haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, they had some YXZs they used for their get around vehicles. So it's kind of fun to see oh, yeah. them uh, hammer around on those things. Um, and then Did you see the episode with the gal who sent the uh, the scout to the moon. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. She she's from Bonner's Ferry. I know her. She's a she's awesome. Yeah, her I know a lot of those Luma's guys are from up here in the northwest. Yeah. So yeah, she there there's this uh, there's this big mud bog event that I, uh, hopefully still goes on this year. That's up in Moye Springs. Yeah. Nor, uh, yeah, and she I think she's one of the people that put it put it on. Speaking of mud, I'm not to interrupt you, but didn't we get a message saying, "Hey, we want you guys to talk a little bit more mud, a little bit more uh, Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, so we've been asking for user feedback on the show and for the content that we're making and we get a lot of feedback saying um, you know, that we're we're West Coasties and that we don't do a whole lot of East Coast all content. All we talk about sand dunes. <laughs> sand dunes and trails is all we talk about. And so, um, yeah. you know, that's not on purpose. It's just the nature of where we're at and what we do um and we would love to see more of the east coast vibe over here and uh what's going on but yeah there's definitely a different vibe uh in the east coast uh, trail scene and then also the southeast uh mud scene and it's a completely different world down there and we're so we're super excited to explore those we've got things. some feelers out yeah we got some feelers out. I, I, I want to talk it for sure yeah so i'm interested in to we you know we were trying to get to some actual like uh, industry events down there, you know, seeing if there was something maybe we could fly over to and experience or something like that. Uh, but, uh, if you guys have, uh, personalities, uh, industry personalities or brands or things like that, that you want us to discuss or interview or things like that, hit us up, send us the tip. And, uh, if you know somebody, let us, you know, loop them in. Uh, we're, we're very interested to know all aspects of UTV and to, to cater content to all the different genres of utv there are different sub segments and um you know just mudding in general like the the hardcore mudding like the southeast mudding yeah is just something we now, don't and have that stuff up here. starting to yeah well it's starting to it's starting to develop up here you're starting to see people take interest in it because i mean obviously things like facebook and instagram make everybody that much closer to us and so access to stuff like that is just a finger you know a finger flick away and you know you see that footage of what's going on in Arkansas, what's going on in Texas. Up here in the Pacific Northwest, there's people paying attention to it and really starting to get into it. So I love it. Yeah, up here uh, in the Northwest, we have uh, Moses Lake Sand Dunes, and there's a group out there, a, a club called Sand Scorpions, and they put on uh, bounty hole contests every year. Um, I'm not sure exactly when they're planning their small tire bounty hole, which includes UTVs. Uh, for this year, but uh, if they can pull it off without us getting uh, locked down, uh, we're definitely going to be there to cover it. And uh, we've been there before. It's always an awesome event. There's really not usually a huge entrant pool uh, for the UTVs into this just because of the nature of submerging your UTV in the mud. But, um, you know, there, there's a small group of people that are trying to do more stuff like that here in the Northwest. Uh, and I know over in Idaho, there's a few um, uh, mud competitions as well. Uh, and so if we can get out to them, uh, we're definitely going to be there and we're going to definitely uh, bring that content to you guys. Um, and then just the East Coast, uh, like trail scene is a completely different animal. And, and it's not that it's the people that are different. It's that the trails are just legitimately different than over here on the West Coast. Uh, out here, we have to basically rely on fire roads. And um, there is no, uh, there's very few private land uh, allocations that will let you go ride off road. Uh, and uh, on the East Coast, you just have uh, a whole different geography, a whole different uh, vegetation footprint. And so um, that's going to be one of those things where we have to actually uh, be there to experience that as well. So if you're an East Coast guy, whether that be trails or mud, um, you know, we're sorry we don't have more content for you, but we would love to bring that discussion to you. So if you have um, any ideas or recommendations, hit us up and we'll definitely pursue those, uh, those opportunities. Yeah, you, you, well, you were talking about Truck Night in America, and, and that kind of is one of those genres where you look through the obstacle courses that they were running those trucks through. It tackles a little bit of everything from uh, highly technical obstacles, mud, just kind of even some stuff where just all bets are off, just pin it and hope for hope for the best, you know? Yeah, there's definitely, um, and then especially sitting here at home with nothing going on, you just want to say, well, I could do that. Well, not necessarily all, all the time. There's right. Cameras do a lot of trickery to the eyes, but... Um, that's definitely uh, stuff that interests me and my kids. And, um, we're definitely trying to figure out ways to do that, uh, this season. So, 
Yeah, check out check out a channel called <clears throat> excuse me, uh called Trail Recon as well. You know, on a show I can't remember maybe it was the last show we did or the show before that we were talking about a uh, a prospector AEV Dodge and that's where I found that AEV Dodge. I've been in communication with this guy since finding that show and it was on a show called Trail Recon. I want to say the kind of the the home unit the home unit car the home build is a i want to say it's a rubicon a red rubicon yeah. four door and yeah very cool show l- l- much like uh much like expedition overland much like a lot of the other shows that i watch where it's a little bit of everything informative and, and that's the that's a youtube channel it's not like on a it is it is tv yeah. or anything Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of cool things out there on YouTube and others. And if you guys have any recommendations for us, uh, let us know. We'll watch them and bring them up uh, into discussion. Uh, I think having a good list of, of content to share with others that might not have found it yet uh, is a great idea. Yeah. So in the interest of uh, keeping the podcast short and sweet, um, you know, we, we've talked about a bunch of things here today, uh, but we got a lot of things coming up and we got some special guests that we're working to schedule in, including uh, possibly some King of the Hammer teams and some athletes from the industry that have nothing else to do. So uh, one, uh, one specific race team that uh, has uh, the most successful short course racer and basically walking the earth right now. So be looking forward to talking to them yep and uh we we are trying to tap some of the resources we have to bring interesting uh, dialogue and and personalities to the podcast but we also want to know what you guys want so if you guys have any ideas uh for some awesome guests uh hit them up uh hit us up send us the tip and uh, we'll get in contact with them uh we want to give a nice variety of uh, personalities and uh so we're looking forward to bringing these guys on uh while we're all at home doing nothing and um the more discussion we can have, the more personalities we can have on. Uh, I think the community will de- at large really enjoy that. But if you guys have any specific requests, uh, definitely hit us up and let us know what you want to see. Yeah, we're going to talk some off-road, man. All over the place, racing, guys that are just out there free riding. Um, yeah, yeah, and Everything. then also let us know what kind of content you want to see outside of the podcast. So if you're looking for product reviews, let us know. If you're looking for just en- pure entertainment, let us know. If you like the vloggy stuff, let us know. Um, we want to make sure we're focusing our efforts in the right area that most entertains and most engages you guys in the community. So looking forward to making more videos. And Yeah, uh, I got to believe that the, the vlogging thing, we probably would have had a few more steps on it had it not been for this global pandemic garbage but <laughs> yeah rona's really cramped our style as far as the vlog goes so um we definitely will be putting out more vlogs uh, as we have the ability to generate content for that uh but when you're not traveling it's it's hard to do that in a in a consistent way so uh we're working sure. on it i got one about halfway there so uh look forward to that coming out at some point in the near future um but uh ian anything else tired <laughs> tired of this want to get out of the house, want to get my car, you know how it goes. So it's really funny. I was just telling my wife the other day, it, we go outside and we we see everybody riding their bikes, going up and down the streets with their dogs and all that. And I just think back to, this must be what it was like in the fifties. Like this didn't exist a few months ago in our neighborhood. Nobody was out riding their bikes. Nobody was out, you know, doing this kind of stuff. And, um, I feel like we're living in the fifties at the moment in my neighborhood. Yeah, I uh when you when you come out to my house there's a couple different ways you can do it and on this one particular one there's it's a little bit more densely populated and I can't look at my phone and drive like I normally do because <laughs> there's so many people out on bikes. It's just so irritating. These people are just so inconsiderate. So but somehow the city uh made it so there's more speed bumps. Yeah. You just <laughs> see all these bikes out I'm like, "Dude, I'm trying to Facebook." <laughs> Disclaimer, we're not endorsing the running over of pedestrians no. or other animals. Please be kind and uh, courteous and be attentive, not on your phone. We do this in humor. So uh, look forward to our next episode. Uh, maybe if everything goes right, we can have some guests on. Uh, but uh, this has been episode 13 recorded on April 21st, and we're excited to be back for episode 14. So until next time. It- the awkward silence yeah so until next time Uh, tell ah you'll get there so until next time everybody peace